All right. Thank you. Thank you, Helene. Good afternoon. And thank everyone for attending, participating in today's webinar. Um, following up with Helene, I want to also thank the Southeastern Partnership for Integrated Biomass Supply Systems, also known as IBIS, the Southern Region Extension Forestry, NC State University's Extension Forestry, and of course, many other partners that have helped and cooperated in this webinar series. Uh, as Helene mentioned, my name is Brent Bailey, and I serve as the State Activities Coordinator for the 25 by 25 Alliance, a diverse grassroots national alliance of nearly 1,000 agriculture, forestry, conservation, business, and environmental organizations working collaboratively, collaboratively to advance the goal of securing 25 percent of the nation's energy needs for renewable resources by the year 2025. I also coordinate the activities of the Southeastern Agriculture and Forestry Energy Resources Alliance, also known as SAFER. And SAFER was formed to bring together representation from across the bioenergy landscape and work to position the South as a national leader in renewable energy production. Today's webinar, we will explore the pathways for developing more biomass resources from short rotation woody crops while at the same time using these plants to improve local soil and water quality conditions. As our global population continues to expand and farm and forest lands are converted to residential, commercial, and industrial uses, we will be pushed to extract more food, feed, fiber, and energy from every acre of arable land. This should cause us to evaluate how we manage our land, water, and other natural resources and look for ways to capture even greater value from marginal, low value lands and lands that may be undesirable for food and livestock production. While demands for food and fiber will grow, so will the demand for energy. I believe global renewable energy markets will grow strongly in the coming decade and beyond, led by policies such as the European Commission 2020 directives, the U.S. Renewable Fuel Standard, state level renewable portfolio standards, and administrative measures to drive us to a more low carbon future. The U.S. EPA alone estimates that there are approximately 490,000 sites and almost 15 million acres of potentially contaminated properties across the U.S. These lands include RICRA sites, brown fields, and abandoned mine lands. Through phytoremediation, we can use plants to clean up pollution in the environment, increase the uptake of nutrients, and improve soil quality and create new biomass supplies. The importance of bioenergy will grow as it becomes a cost competitive renewable energy option and one of the few systems supply continuous renewable heat and power on a large scale basis. The next generation of biofuel plants which makes fuels from non-food biomass are also coming online. However, there remains concerns about the price, sustainability, and availability of biomass as demand for solid biomass based fuels and feedstocks increase. These concerns also fuel the search for non-forestry alternative biomass options. In light of these challenges and opportunities, researchers at NC State University and other institutions around the nation are looking at how plants can take up and break down toxics and other pollutants and pair that with other ways to increase usefulness of plants, including for energy, bioenergy. Today, joining us is uh, talk about some of his research in this field is Sean Dyson, Dyson, De Sean Dyson Shifflett. Sean is a PhD student in the Department of Forestry and Environmental Resources at NC State. He received his Master's of Science in Natural Resources at North Carolina State University after completing his research on the establishment of tree species trials on municipal wastewater application sites. Sean's current work explores the impacts of growing woody biomass on marginal and degraded lands to meet the future demands of the bioenergy industry. His interests lie in the use of phytoremediation to mitigate human environmental impacts through the integration of the hydrolo hydrological cycle, water quality assessments, and nutrient balances of lands converted for bioenergy production. Sean, I want to thank you for joining us today. And before you get started, I do want to remind the audience that uh, to send questions through the chat box to Helene, and she will be collecting them for the question and answer period immediately following, following Sean's presentation. Sean, turning the controls over to you, and thank you for joining and participating on today's webinar. Awesome. Thank you so much, Brent. Uh, and thanks, Helene, for inviting me to speak on this topic. I hope you all enjoy the discussion. 
And to reiterate uh, Brent's point, if you all have any questions during the presentation, feel free to type them into the chat window. I'll ask that Helene stop me for any questions and I'll respond to the best of my knowledge. So, uh, as Brent mentioned, my name is Sean Dason Shiflett and I'm going to be discussing the use of short rotation woody crops for phytoremediation applications or also known as phytotechnologies. I am in my third year at NC State and I work primarily with Dr. Elizabeth Nichols and Dr. Dennis Hazel on the potential of woody biomass in North Carolina. So to start, I'd like to define a few terms. Uh, let's start with short rotation woody crops. These are highly productive tree plantations that have gained quite a bit of attention with regulators and researchers as a means to produce woody biomass. Short rotation woody crops are more often than not a hardwood tree species, but carnivorous species like pines have been considered. The plantations are primarily characterized by high densities and short rotations. And as you can see here on this slide, that can be as low as 162 trees per acre up to uh, 8,100 trees per acre. And we have seen some stands with uh, densities as high as 16,200 trees per acre. As you can imagine, those types of stands are a little hard to walk through, but they are looking at pro high productivity with something like a willow species. Um, the most common trees for short rotation woody crops are hybrid poplars, shown here as populous species, willows, shown as the salic species, and of course, eucalyptus species. Now, each one of these species is very sensitive to different environmental conditions. Uh, poplars and willows do need a lot of water available to them, whereas eucalyptus need some water but also dry conditions and are very sensitive to temperature. Many policy folks are worried about where we're going to start sourcing our woody biomass. We don't want to convert our agricultural lands as this could drive up our commodity prices. We also want to preserve our natural and established forests so we can maintain all of the ecosystems they provide. Furthermore, we want to be cautious about using other tree plantations as this may change the dynamics of our timber and pulp markets. So we really don't have many options if we want to make sustainable choices. Because if we, as I said, use agricultural lands, we could potentially be paying a lot more for our foods. And if we look towards our established forests, we really have kind of a timeline on which we can really rely on those. Uh, and a lot of people have really debated the topic of using woody biomass from established forests. So that statement is not concrete, but it is a thought. One option that has gained momentum is the use of marginal and degraded lands for short rotation woody crop systems. These lands have many issues ranging from soil compaction and steep slopes to soil and groundwater contamination from volatile organic carbons, also known as VOCs, and the alike. Uh, marginal and degraded lands offer many benefits when we're talking about short rotation woody crops. They avoid directly competing with food production. They help preserve biodiversity and pristine ecosystems. The, we can see the potential improvement of these degraded lands under certain regimens. And we can provide financial gains on these lands that are otherwise not generating dollars. If we look globally, we see that there is quite a bit of marginal and degraded land. The conditions of these sites are variable and each site will require a targeted effort to produce a bioenergy feedstock that could meet the needed eight tons per acre, uh, eight tons per acre per year uh, needed for energy security. Uh, this particular map that I have up now was produced in 2011 um, by a paper by Dishison et al. And they show that there is an estimated 1,062 to 1,433 million acres globally available for uh, degraded lands. If we look to the U.S., we find that nearly 15% of the global biomass could be produced on marginal lands alone. Uh, according to Milbrandt et al. in 2014, there are 
somewhere between 140 and 150 million acres that could be targeted for woody biomass production. If we went even further to incorporate degraded lands into these metrics, we could see an increase in the percentage, but we would need to ab approach those lands a little more cautiously, as I've mentioned before. So before we go forward, let's define what a marginal and degraded site is. The general definition is shown here that they are sites where agricultural production is not suggested either for economic purposes or for human health purposes. The definition of phytotechnology or phytoremediation is a set of technology using plants to remediate or contain contaminants in soil, groundwater, surface water, or sediments. And that definition is provided by the Interstate Technology and Regulatory Council. If we observe these two definitions together, we can understand why we would want to use sites with phytotechnologies or existing phytoremediation efforts for woody biomass production as an example of marginal and degraded lands. So this slide shows four mechanisms of phytotechnologies. Uh, several other subcategories exist, but they are not shown. One of these is phytovolatization, which is where a plant transpires volatile compounds that have been stored in the soil or water. And I'm going to see if I can make this marker work and show you where that is. Yeah, so that one's, this one up here in the top left is phytovolatization. This is primarily for volatile organics and stuff that uh, degrades over time, like uh, TCE or tetrachloroethylene or trichloroethylene for that matter. Uh, there are lots of others that are used for, lots of other contaminants that are used for that particular me mechanism. Uh, another form is phytostabilization, in which uh, the plant immobilizes contaminants to prevent them from moving off site. And that's shown over here in the top right. Uh, that particular mechanism is mostly for stuff like PCBEs, uh, PCBs uh, and other organics like that. Um, next is phytostabilization. Uh, phytostabilization here shown in the bottom left is where some plants sequester and immobilize the contaminants by storing them in their roots. Um, that's primarily metals are used in that. And then we also have phytoextraction over here in the bottom right, and that is very similar to phytostabilization, but instead of keeping them in the root system, they're brought up to the stem and the leaves and stored there. Now, particularly with phytostabilization and phytoextraction, depending on which species you use, you have to be concerned with where that waste goes after the fact, especially if you're working with trees uh, after they senesce or if they lose their leaves those contaminants can then be moved back into the soil. So there's a careful dance there between the species that you use and how you manage your contaminants. Uh, a couple of other phytotechnologies include phytohydraulics, uh, rhizodegradation, and rhizostabilization. So there are many different species used in phytotechnologies, ranging from annuals like pumpkins and sunflowers to trees like loblolly pine and hybrid poplars. Uh, I've mentioned this, but it is important to note that the species used as a phytotechnology is critical to successful remediation. We wouldn't want to plant pumpkins for phytovolatization as they're unlikely to transpire at a rate sufficient to move uh, certain contaminants. They would also need to be treated as a hazardous waste product afterward, and the, that is one of the things that we want to kind of be aware of that we're managing. Uh, the particular ability that I find really interesting is trees and their ability to transpire large amounts of water. That is ultimately what makes them a good phytotechnology on mar marginal and degraded lands because they are able to offer an added benefit as they can subsequently be coppiced and used for woody biomass. But as I mentioned, each species has to be matched to site conditions. 
At this point, I'd like to take a moment and highlight some other resources for folks interested in phytoremediation and phytotechnology. Uh, there are several resources available out there. Uh, firstly, consult with an expert. An expert. I'm sorry. Um, one, uh, my advisor, Elizabeth Nichols at NC State, has a great deal of experience working with a variety of phytotechnologies. Uh, you can look her up at the NC State website. Also, the Interstate Technology and Regulatory Council offers a cumulative training and a thought framework on how to approach candidate sites for phytotechnology. The US EPA offers a citizen's guide to phytoremediation that also steps through several other types of phytotechnologies. And perhaps one of my favorite resources is Cool's Brownfields to Greensfields, a field guide for phytoremediation. It's a very well designed document that breaks down each step of uh, phytoremediation and how to correctly match species to contaminants. It also has great visual aids to help the reader wrap his or her mind around the issues. And I've included one of those issues, uh, one of those visuals here where you can see that she's laid out three different tree species, a bald cypress, a loblolly pine, and a hybrid poplar. And uh, sh along the bottom, she so has shown which contaminants those species are capable of remediating, and also the process through which they are doing that remediation. Uh, here we see this uh, micro, or uh, what's that called? A, uh, a anyhow, it's a, um, a lens with wings on it to in indicate phytovolatization. And then we have the hazard sign for phytostabilization. All right. So now that we have some background on phytotechnologies and on short rotation woody crops, I'd like to focus on a case study to give example of how these systems work. One application of phytotechnologies is the use of trees to remediate land applied biosolids and municipal wastewaters. North Carolina has 90,000 acres avail available for municipal wastewater application and 82,000 acres available for land applied biosolids. One of the largest wastewater application lands in the country is located in Jacksonville, North Carolina. And as you can see in this map produced by Lori Nielsen in her fact sheet titled Using Municipal Waste Sites for Cellulosic Biomass Production in North Carolina, we can start to get a feel for where these sites are located and how much land is available at each site. Many of these sites, uh, approximately 21%, are currently in hay production, and they could be strong candidates for woody biomass production. But further evaluation would be needed to really uh, determine how good and how productive they might be for woody biomass. Um, so the next slide I'm going to kind of go straight forward with is to highlight the fact that wastewater application to trees is just another phytotechnology. Um, these lands are, margin, are considered marginal and degraded because we cannot grow food on them and we really wouldn't want to consume food from a wastewater application site. And the phytotechnology is doing two different things. It is firstly managing the water and it is also managing nutrient loading to shallow groundwater. Um, Groundwater on these sites is regulated by, in North Carolina, it's regulated by North Carolina Department of Energy and or Department, Department of Environment and Natural Resources, uh, which is, of course, overseen at the federal level by EPA. Uh, research from around the world has shown land application of municipal wastewaters can support woody biomass production and, in many cases, increase woody biomass production. Here in the US, we've been using it, uh, I say here almost 30 years, but it's actually almost 40 years based on this author's comment. When we want to use short rotation woody crops on wastewater application fields, we can find multiple benefits. Firstly, they respond to the applied water and nutrients. It can be positive, it can be negative. We've seen both, and I'll talk a little bit about that in our case study. Uh, they remove large amounts of nutrients supplied by the effluent through harvesting. That means if we're looking at carbon sequestration, you, when you cut these trees, you can then move that carbon off site. Um, trees transpire water at a high rate over a long growing system, especially here in North Carolina when we're looking at something from like March to November. Uh, they 
prevent soil erosion by water and wind. Uh, they maintain soil structures so as to maintain or improve water infiltration rate and permeabilities of the soils. They can be used by society without transmitting harmful pathogenic organisms. That might be an issue if you were trying to grow lettuce on these sites, right? Uh, and they also help move nutrients or heavy metals out of the food chain. And lastly, and perhaps more importantly, is they provide a cash return to cover operating and maintaining the wastewater application system and perhaps even provide a capital investment. So as mentioned before, wastewater application sites typically have the objective to mitigate shallow groundwater contamination from nutrients. And uh, we can see that here on the figure on the right, which was adopted from Brewer, Cole, and Schweiss in 1979. This was a study conducted in northern Florida where they tested irrigation rates under uh, a non-vegetated land, a grassland, and establishing poplar trees. And you know, during the first year, the big concern was that they, when applying to poplars large amounts of ammonia, they did see an increased concentration of nitrate in the water. But the application rate for this particular study was much higher than would be used these days. The study was being conducted when that application rate was still kind of being felt out. But then after the second year, that concentration of nitrate was dramatically reduced under a poplar stand relative to the grass stand or a non-vegetated stand. The um, second objective of these studies is to produce woody biomass. If we're able to hit two birds with one stone, we're having a much more sustainable approach to dealing with uh, um, producing an energy product that can be both effective on site and and, and provide that market return. Um, these types of systems, as I mentioned, are critical to having a successful future in bioenergy. Oops. All right. So the next thing, and I've mentioned this before broadly with phytoremediation, but we also have to consider when we're trying to produce woody biomass and remediate nutrient contamination, that we have to match the species we use to the wastewater application system. Uh, many trees are not, we'll call it designed, to handle the high hydraulic loading. And as we can see here on this figure on the left, um, some species actually improve based on how much water they receive. So this would be cottonwoods. When they're getting nearly 19 centimeters per week, they seem to have even more uh, biomass productivity than a lot of other species. Something more like bald cypress, which is shown down here or known as Taxodium ditchum, uh, really didn't show any improvement in biomass with regard to how much growth it was seeing, but it did show consistent growth despite the different application rates. So that might be something that's important if you're working with a high loading system when you're trying to get high biomass. And it also reflects that tree species is really important to what type of application you're using. And one of the problems that they faced in this particular study is that they had really high nitrate in their groundwater after application. And this, again, is another example of exceeding that regulatory limit. But as I mentioned before, these effluent application rates don't necessarily reflect how much effluent is applied to current wastewater sites. It's, it's a little bit higher than what you'd expect. Uh, right now, what most people are applying is around an inch a week. It can be more, it can be a little less, but that's, that's the mean amount. Now, uh, some species matching has already occurred in North Carolina. Uh, Dr. Doug Frederick of North Carolina State evaluated American sycamore and sweet gum at a wastewater application site in Easton, North Carolina. Uh, this study showed that American sycamore performed strongest in growth but weakest in survival. And that can be seen here in the figure on the left. Uh, if we look at height and this height, we see that the uh, sweet gum did uh, not sycamore, I'm sorry, uh, sycamore did best between the years of 5 and 10. Uh, they were very similar in volume after 5 years of growth, but once we got up to 10 years of growth, the sycamore had done a lot better. And then this bottom figure is their dry biomass after 5 and 10 years. Um, and like I said, though 
Sycamore was doing really well as far as its biomass production. It had a much lower, well, not much lower, but a, a lower survival rate relative to the sweet gum. So uh, Dr. Frederick's research provided the foundation for a species trial that we wanted to conduct on short rotation woody crops on two wastewater application sites in North Carolina. Uh, Dr. Nichols, Dr. Hazel, and I planted two intensively managed trials in Gibson and Jacksonville, North Carolina. Uh, the two sites were very different. Uh, Gibson is a much smaller facility and it is managed by Greg Leonard in the town of Gibson. Whereas Jacksonville is a large facility with multiple operators and a much larger population base. As I mentioned before, Jacksonville is one of the largest wastewater application sites in the nation. Uh, if we look here at the figure um, of North Carolina, we can see that the facility size of Jacksonville is 293.7 hectares, whereas Gibson is a, a little bit smaller. Um, Unfortunately, our study site at Jacksonville was a little bit smaller. We were only looking at about a half hectare size, whereas at Gibson, you'll see in a bit, we had a much larger, larger area to work with. At each site, we planted trees at a six foot by six foot spacing. Uh, the soils were loamy sand and loamy fine sand with respect to Gibson and Jacksonville. Uh, land application was very similar between sites with 1,102 millimeters per hectare at Gibson and 1,109 millimeters per hectare at Jacksonville. Nutrient loading was very similar on a per tree basis. Um, one significant difference we did see between the sites was the depth to groundwater. Jacksonville had a much more shallow water table that led to occasionally poor conditions on site. And by that I mean we saw pooling every so often. And that is a little bit more difficult for tree establishment as it can suffocate the roots. Another difference between the sites were the previous uses. So at Gibson, we had a managed American sycamore plantation that had been dealing with a case of bacterial leaf scorch. And so it was defoliating very early in the year and not effectively able to transpire a lot of the water that was being applied. And at Jacksonville, we had uh, fallow ground that had not been managed at all. There was a lot of grasses, a lot of weeds, a lot of very aggressive weeds uh, that led to a few other complications later on in, in, the, in the experiment. Um, previous use is an important consideration when starting a short rotation woody crop because it influences what type of weed management practice you have to have afterwards. So at Gibson, we were able to just routinely mow, whereas at Jacksonville, we had to mow, apply herbicides, even sometimes get down on our hands and knees and pull out grass just to prevent them from taking over the trees. Uh, our objectives for this study were twofold. Uh, we wanted to evaluate woody biomass production by different tree species under wastewater irrigation because we wanted to know which species grew best. And we also wanted to evaluate the impact of land applied municipal wastewater during tree establishment because we wanted to make sure we were meeting our regulatory guidelines for nitrate and ammonia. We planted a wide range of tree species. And here I've provided some images of what mature trees look like for each species. These were not taken from the sites. Uh, so uh, up here in the top left, we have bald cypress, followed by loblolly pine, sweet gum, eucalyptus benthamii, which is commonly known as Camden white gum, but more often than not, people just refer to it as benthamii. And then we had quite a variety of hybrid poplars. Uh, next we had green ash, uh, cherry bark oak, and then white oak. Uh, at Jacksonville, uh, just to summarize a little bit about what these J's and G's mean at the bottom, we planted uh, bald cypress, loblolly pine, American sweet gum, eucalyptus benthamii, 12 populous clones, and then green ash. At Gibson, we planted bald cypress, loblolly pine, American sweet gum, eucalyptus benthamii, 40 populous clones, green ash, cherry bark oak, and white oak. We also, uh, as mentioned, we needed to make sure that we weren't exceeding our regulatory limits. 
so we installed monitoring wells to take monthly sample concentrations of nitrate and nitrite uh, and ammonia. We also collected TKN for this study, but we didn't report the values in the published paper. Uh, here in the photos, you can see part of the process needed to install the wells. First, we augured manually to the water table and then augured further to ensure at least three feet of water was in each well. It was <laughs> quite the backbreaking experience. Um, next, we installed PVC pipes with well screens and backfilled the wells with gravel. Uh, once we installed the cover, we covered each well with a shroud to protect it from outside damage. That became really important because there was a lot of uh, wildlife moving through these sites, both white-tailed deer and uh, birds and a good variety of turkey. So here in this figure, you can see the location of Jacksonville, the location of the study site within the entire facility, and the location of the installed wells. Uh, one thing you will notice is the surrounding pine stand. This was another source of problems for us as it created some shading across the site and really limited um, sunlight hours for all of the new growing trees. The same can be see here, seen here for Gibson. Um, Gibson had a much more open plan. The previous stand of American Sycamore had been removed in November of the year prior, so that would be November 2011. Uh, so there was not very much shading to prevent the trees from growing. Once everything had been planted, we drew up these schematics to show the location of each planting relative to irrigation riser and surface elevation. Uh, so here, as I mentioned before, you can see the 40 populous clones that we planted at Gibson, uh, the location of the lagoon and the elevation contours across the site. We did have um, two different planting dates for our uh, native tree species. So we had Atlantic white cedar, bald cypress, cherry bark oak, green ash, some hybrid poplars, wabali pine, and white oak planted in 2011. And then in 2012, we came back and replanted uh, sweet gum, lavali pine, bald cypress, green ash, and eucalyptus. Over here at Jacksonville, you can see the site layout was a little bit different. Here on the uh, southeast side of the site, we planted all of our poplars. And then on the northwest side, we planted the bald cypress, eucalyptus, benthamii, green ash, lavali pine, and sweet gum. Um, let me go back for a second. Uh, once we had all these schematics grown up, we inventoried the initial height of all tree plantings in early spring. So for anything that was planted as a bare root seedling, and that was all of the hardwood uh, native trees, as well as eucalyptus and thamii, and we began to track the growth of each tree. And so finally, in October of 2012, we completed a second inventory of all the tree plantings, which brings me to my next slide, which shows uh, mortality of each tree, and oh, well, actually it's each clone in each species per site. So um, we found many species to have very good survival. However, some, like Atlantic white cedar, shown as AWC here, and cherry bark oak, shown as CBO here, had pretty poor survival. Uh, La Lolly Pine also did not do very well. Um, there's a lot of reasons why that happened, both, again, herbivory, weed management, and uh, hydraulic loading. Uh, growth amongst the poplar clones varied quite a bit. Here I'm providing you a box plot, or the box and whisker plot of their mean growth as well as their interquartile ranges with outlier values. Um, growth at Gibson was generally better. Uh, here you can see that the mean was closer to about 200 centimeters. And growth at Jacksonville was much less, and that was, again, due to the deer herbivory, periodic flooding, and extreme weed conditions. And here in the basal diameter values, you can see similar trends. Uh, looking at the other tree species planted, we see that tree species native to North Carolina did not produce as much biomass as the poplars. Um, but despite all that, green ash and bald cypress were really 
strong candidates for use in the system. Maybe not from a woody biomass perspective, but they had really high survival and they continue to be very impressive on these sites as they are still trucking along and have not had as many issues with the weed competition. Uh, with respect to groundwater contamination, we did not find very much evidence to suggest that the groundwater was showing evidence of high nutrient loading after irrigation. We only found one sample collected in February of 2012 at Jacksonville to exceed the regulatory limits set by NC Diener. Um, all of the ammonia samples were consistently below the provisional regulatory limit, which is set forth by NC Diener also. So um, given our experiences at those sites, we concluded that there were a few lessons that we learned. First and foremost is that weed management was critical to successful establishment of these short rotation weedy crops. And we've had to reapply that to all of our, that knowledge to all of our new sites that are going out there. And it's, it's making a very concerted effort to keep on top of those weeds. That's really going to help us see better growth out of these plantations. Damage from herbivory can stunt growth, and there may be a need for management at these sites. So we did not do any sort of uh, management for deer or other um, insects that might be consuming the foliar tissue on the trees. And we did observe that mean nutrient concentrations of nitrate were maintained below regulatory limits at both sites, but like I said, we did see that one sample. Um, Species and clone selection really didn't show uh, a lot of statistical differences in growth after establishment, and that's more likely due to the amount of time that we looked at this study, so we were only looking at one year worth of growth. It may take three to four years of species trials to really evaluate what the most productive species might be on a wastewater application site, and that lesson is speaks to other phyto technologies. If you want to evaluate which, uh, which species is going to be the most productive, you're going to need more than one year's data if you're looking at trees. Now, something that's a uh, perennial or an annual may not need as much data to really evaluate how um, effective it is at its particular growth. Next, um, we kind of have thought a lot about how native tree species might be used for woody biomass. And though many of them are just not as productive, they show a lot of success at Jacksonville. They have high survival. They are maintaining their growth. And they're not as subject to a lot of the weed competition that's happening there on site. Poplars, on the other hand, um, at Gibson have performed superior to all other plantings. They're at about five meters now, and they continue to grow. Um, having a strong grip on site conditions, both previous and current, can help manage the new short rotation woody crop system. And that really speaks to uh, whether that was fallow ground or not. When you're working with a, a site that has not really had much management before, it's going to be a little bit more work up front to try and keep those grasses and weeds under control or you end up uh, having to do 10 times the amount of work after the fact. So that kind of ends my case study on growing woody biomass on municipal wastewater sites. And as a follow-up thought, I'd like to present this figure published in a letter to Nature uh, that makes a good point that even though marginal and degraded sites are great opportunities for phytotechnologies and woody biomass production, we also have to be cognizant of their proximity to pellet mills and biorefineries and other bioethanol producers. In the figure, as you can see here, these circles represent an 80 kilometer radius around each of the mills. Some of these lands, especially those out here in the west, are highly productive and would be viable options for the mills. Those others that are not as close to good, productive, marginal lands may not be as good of an option. And we really need to hone in on what are the most productive marginal integrated lands and which species we want to put on those sites to really access our biomass uh, capabilities for energy, energy security purposes. And with that, I'd like to say thank you. Um, 
and make a few acknowledgments. Firstly, to Arbor Gen for donating some of the tree material that we used, and that was with Dr. Jeff Wright. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge the former Biofuel Center of North Carolina for providing the tuition assistance and research support that I received during this research. Uh, the town of Jacksonville and Gibson for cooperation throughout the experiment, as also my committee members from my masters, Dr. Dennis Hazel, Dr. Elizabeth Guthrie Nichols, and Dr. Douglas Frederick. And at this point, if you all have any questions, feel free to shoot them my way. Sean, I do have a question for you. OK. Um, thank you for that wonderful presentation. Um, it's been great to learn what you've been doing out there for the past couple of years. I uh, always see you and Dennis coming back to, to campus muddy and um, tired. And I know you guys spent a lot of time <laughs> out there during your research. Um, so one of the questions is from uh, Bob uh, Hedberg. He wants to know, um, or it's kind of a statement, he says, one study um, was done with red pine plantations used for sewage biosolid uh, disposal. And it was found that there is uh, toxicity to boron as an uh, excess micronutrient. Uh, is that, could that be a consideration on a mortality on your site? Um, I, I only kind of caught half of that. Toxicity to what? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, to boron? I'm not familiar with that, unfortunately. Um, but broadly, yes, there is a concern with toxicity on these sites, especially if there are lots of metals in the water. They can lead to some um, debilitation of the trees to take up the nutrients that they need for growth. Um, there is also some concern with the amount of salt that's in the water, especially with poplars. They can uh, show some unique <laughs> rooting mechanisms after they're getting exposed to high, highly saline waters. Um, and you know, there's not a toxicity issue, but there's also you know, a disease and pest concern because with things like the emerald ash borer, we don't want to plant large, bowl, uh, sorry, large green ash sites because we are concerned about how much pest damage can really influence these things. So yes, um, toxicity is a concern, but I'm not as familiar with that one particular um, uh, contaminant. So I guess from your presentation, nitrogen is really what um, you have yeah, we were, on? We were focusing on the nutrient loading. Uh, each one of these wastewater sites has to monitor uh, lead and arsenic and all of that stuff on these sites. We just weren't particularly focusing on those contaminants for this study. Okay. Um, the next question is, um, are there charts available that show what trees take up what metals and um, where they store them, such as, are they, is it in the roots, trunks, or leaves? Uh, yeah, let me get back to that other resources slide. So if you, um, if you consult with the IITRC training website, they have a thought framework that really kind of shows which species would be best matched for what types of contaminants. And then if you're looking for something that's a little bit more uh, <laughs> easily digested, I would direct you towards this brown fields to green fields. Uh, field Guide to Phytoremediation. If you just Google it, it's actually available as a PDF online. And it goes through all of, um, about, I want to say it, it's about 50 different plant species and what metals they can remediate and where they're stored. Uh, it's a really good handbook. It's a little bit more guided towards urban contamination and urban sites. Uh, the woman who uh, authored it is a professor up at uh, I want to say she's a professor up at Columbia. I could be wrong about that. Um, and she put this together, this document, to really make it a little bit more accessible to the average person. OK, I'm still um, waiting for some other questions here. Sean, I, I had a question. Um, <laughs> OK. So I know that the weeds were a great, you know, a lot of difficulty and problem with, um, you know, establishing the trees. And I was wondering, is, is there any nurseries or anybody out there that's like maybe looking for a Roundup Ready um, 
short rotation woody crop where you just go out there and spray for these weeds and not hurt the plant? Yeah, so uh, Dr. Dennis Hazel has been working, is just beginning to start working with a new uh, herbicide treatment that he can apply to those trees. I don't remember the name of that off the top of my head. Maybe he could type it in for me uh, and, and remind me of what the name of that particular herbicide is. But yeah, there there is some efforts to figure out which herbicides can be used on these trees. Um, but particularly at Jacksonville, we were working with herbicide or with um, grasses that were very aggressive. Uh, we were working with yellow nut sedge uh, as a weed and also Johnson grass, and they were just growing at such a point to um, they they were out competing the trees. And we also had a big issue with honeysuckle growing up the main stems of the trees, and they were. Uh, pulling down the trees, so we had to go on and manually remove those. But specifically to herbicides, we used a, a glyphosate to try and treat, these, to treat um, the the weed conditions on the site, and it was useful most of the time. But we needed to apply more frequently than I think we initially anticipated. So well, here's a good idea that um, I was put forward for some in the audience. They said, "Why not um, try mulch instead of herbicides? I guess put mulch between the rows." That's not a bad idea. I hadn't thought about that. Um, that might be something experimenting with, but truthfully, if you're looking at putting in as few inputs as possible, I don't know how much mulch would cost relative to herbicide. So if mulch is an expensive, if you're looking at a really large short rotation woody crop plantation, you wouldn't want to invest too much money on, on a mulch. Um, but I'm I, unfortunately not very familiar with how much mulch costs. Um, well, Dennis, uh, Dr. Hazel added um, that you know you guys are looking at more at reduced rates of commonly used herbicides um, to give you control about tree toxicity. So that was just a comment from Dr. Hazel. He's he's working with Sean. Um, I guess another another comment, you know, mulch and then the pruning of the trees. Yeah, we don't actually prune the trees. Um, so because our our primary objective is to produce more biomass, we don't cut anything down. And when we're establishing the trees, there's no existing um, wood product to, to mulch. Now, that's not necessarily true if you're looking at a clear-cut site. There would be some option of mulching there if you had you know, working with a tree stand that had been otherwise uh, clear-cut for it to be put out in the market. Um, we have seen and we do work with one of those sites, but they have a very different issue. Um, uh, one of the new sites we're working with at Jacksonville, they clear cut a pine plantation there and bedded the site and left all of the residues and mulch on top of those beds, but that didn't really have a good effect. Uh, what we're seeing now is that the weeds have gotten even more aggressive and they're, they're um, go still growing up on the beds and that, that hasn't really been an effective technique. And I think maybe pairing mulching with herbicide might be an interesting idea and see where that goes, but we haven't conducted any studies on that and I haven't found anything. Okay, so this is pretty interesting. Um, so I'm not sure if you guys have done the harvest yet and, and you know, if you have, where, where would the biomass go? And this is a short-term project. Um, so we, we haven't harvested. We have harvested some stuff that we have at a different site, but it didn't end up going anywhere. Uh, we kept it on site to evaluate how much wood had been produced. Um, because these studies are not that large, uh, I don't know if they would be able to go to a different mill or where we would send them. Um, the end goal is to evaluate how productive these sites could be. So what we would hope to get out of these sites is productivity values and also um, uh, how much biomass could be grown per acre per year. And with that data, we might replant the site. You, you would replant the site with that particular species and then site it to the closest mill or um, bioenergy production facility that could make use of them. Uh, there, there is a lot of uh, thoughts out there about how to best do that. 
Some of them is more of a spatial analysis where you look at how close they are as the bird flies to different males, but there are also you know, more um, uh, detailed analyses. I think Helene uh, completed one where she uh, looked at how looked at different concurrent radiuses around each one of these mills to see how far uh, loggers might go to transport wood to those sites. But for this particular research, we're just trying to get an idea of how productive these sites can be and how we would uh, expect the best, what we would expect the best species to be. No, you're, you're right. I mean, it probably would just be best to chip them up on site and use them on, put them on the roads or pathways. Um, but Sean, there's a couple other questions. This is one related to harvesting. Um, so do you have any uh, plans for how you will harvest the site? Um, what about the soils mechanics? Um, will, they, will they be affected by the, um, the wastewater disposal, I guess, when you're, when you're bringing out machinery out there? And um, Yeah, so we haven't developed a good extensive plan on how to harvest these things especially when you're talking about different spacings. Uh, when you're getting to that really close, uh, you know, three foot by three foot spacings, there's not really a lot of good equipment out there that could be used to harvest it. A couple of thoughts that we've had is using feller bunchers for the, you know, wider spacings. And then we've also seen stuff like the bio baler, which could be a potential product to use as if we were looking at smaller size uh, tree plantings. Um, but no, we, we haven't really identified how you would harvest this. Now, for experimental purposes, purposes, we would obviously cut the trees down and weigh them individually to figure out what biomass and densities can be expected from these sites. So we're not as concerned with their long-term harvesting, but that is something that we've thought about and have talked about, and we really don't have a good answer to what would be the best mechanism to do that. Um, the soil mechanics that could be affected. Uh, so at Gibson, you know, the soil, the soils are still holding up pretty well. We haven't seen too much compaction despite multiple large vehicles driving over the site. At Jacksonville, especially because the water table is so high, um, I think you'd be more concerned with, the, with your tractor getting stuck in the mud because uh, it, it gets pretty dense. Uh, well, it just gets really mucky and we, we have, in fact, gotten a tractor stuck in the mud there trying to plant trees. Well, thank you, Sean. Um, that concludes the questions. Um, since this is still ongoing and your research is ongoing, um, when do you expect to, to have a, you know, some published material or um, be completed with the research at these two sites? Uh, so all of the figures that I presented today are from our publication in Bioenergy Research uh, from 2013. Um, that can be found uh, through NC State's library system. Um, yeah, and then we're we're going to continue working on getting out data that we find out have found from other sites. Uh, some of that we're hoping to get out by the end of the summer, um, but we're 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 trucking along. We're trying to get that information out to everyone who wants it. Okay, just want to let everybody know that um, the a recording of this webinar is available um, at the Bioenergy webinars. Uh, Sean Shiflett, thank you so much for um, sharing your research and uh, your experiences out there um, at those two field sites. It's been very um, interesting and, you know, if anyone has any questions, um, you know, feel free to email Sean um, Shiflett. His information is on the, the home page of this webinar series. I'd like to thank Brent for um, introducing our speaker day and, you know, for his participation with this webinar series. And just one more mention for turn over to Brent for some last goodbyes. Um, we do have the next webinar coming up May 13th, and that will be on biomass uh, market access standards. Um, so please tune in for that. And I hope to see everyone here on that call. And Brent, anything else you want to add? No, I just want to say thanks again to Sean and everyone on participating. Uh, I think it's a really, really neat topic going forward. Is uh, as Sean mentioned, there's a lot of opportunities for, for, for marginal, unused, low-value lands for biomass development, as well as uh, solving other challenges that lay out there, particularly in regards to uh, pollution issues. So look forward to continue, continue seeing his research move forward. Okay, I'm going to... Um, 
maybe use the wrong thing here. I'm going to push out <laughs> the, uh, the link for everyone to d finish up for their continuing education credits. You should be um, pushed out shortly. If not, I typed the link in the chat window. You don't have time to wait. But it should redirect you um, to finish your you know, process to get your continuing education credits. But thank you, and that's everything.